In the first two episodes, we covered both the birth of Linux and the open source philosophy that led to Linux's explosive growth around the world. So how does Ubuntu's philosophy become so representative of Linux in general? Well, you're about to find out. If this content interests you, then subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of future episodes. In the early 2000s, Linux had to prepare for the future by facing the past. That if Linux needs to be ready for the desktop, then Linux needs to be ready for both old and new computers too. And so with this user-friendly philosophy, some new key distributions were created. Here's a look at three popular ones. First, Canonical's Ubuntu. This is an African philosophy that means humanity to others, among other translations. And it's chosen for its goal of being the community distro of Linux. Well, why community? Well, Ubuntu begins to start pushing the industry towards using a universal software experience because the computer software industry was competing and divided among several platforms and Ubuntu aimed to solve that problem. Ubuntu had two things going for it. One, the advantage of being one of the first to market, and it also inherited the useful .deb package format, which came from Debian, and it created a great user experience on the desktop. A package manager is a collection of software tools that automates the process of installing, upgrading, configuring, and removing computer programs. And second, there was a distro called Lindos, which was interoperable with the Windows DLL. DLL stands for Dynamic Link Library, which is a library of data that can be shared by more than one program at the same time. So it's like putting all your data into a cardboard box, and then every program has access to that box. So now with Windows, you didn't need Wine as a virtualization or any kind of wrapper. You could run Windows applications on Linux. However, because of copyright reasons, Windows changed their name to Linspire, and then to finally Freespire, as it's known as today. And third, there was Linux Mint. This was meant to be a sort of drop and replace of Windows. It had the look, feel, and behaved exactly like Windows for users who were familiar with that operating system, but on Linux. So the philosophy of interoperability and community was growing. And around that same time, the puppy Linux distro was born. This was an ultra small variety of Linux that you could run from a CD or a floppy disk. So now you had Linux that could be everywhere and it was ready for not only just the desktop, but any desktop. And on its architecture, Linux was a single shell operating system. There could only be one user logged in to do one thing at one time. And around 2003, the concept of user spacing was created by having a version of the Linux kernel inside of another Linux server. Sort of like what we know today as software sandboxing. So if user spacing sounds like a virtual machine, then that's because it sort of is. Founded in 2003, Linode was one of the first companies to create a push button, get a virtual machine business model. And then if you needed to jump to a Linux machine from another machine, then you could just SSH into it. And that jump is made possible because of the combination of both multiplexing and user spacing. And as we get into 2010, Linux desktops have become so commonplace that there are multiple ones to choose from, including multiple types of the same distribution. This allowed users to choose, for instance, between Zubuntu, which uses the XFCE desktop environment, or Ubuntu's GNOME desktop. And now enter Ubuntu's Unity approach. So Ubuntu begins to start pushing the industry towards using a universal software experience. So if someone builds software for Red Hat, then it will work on any preferred user configuration. So that takes us to 2018, the container timeline. Containers are a way to ensure that a piece of software and its dependencies are packaged together so that they can run anywhere. And when it comes to containers, the main tools are considered to be Docker, Vagrant, and Kubernetes. And so Kubernetes is an open source container container orchestration system for automating computer application deployment, scaling, and management. And so sometimes you might hear Kubernetes be called K8s. Well, that's because there's eight letters between the K and the S. And so Kubernetes, or K8s, allows a computer to improvise based on instructions that you give it. You describe the K8s what you want, how many containers, and how they're configured, and then it just runs itself without you needing to touch it. So it's basically self-running, self-healing, and self-creating. And so now Linux can run on toasters, in cars, siloed containers, and literally everywhere. And as of today, you have off-the-shelf software solutions for creating your own Linux distros, virtualizations, and one-click installations for almost anything. And so what's next? 
Well, Linux got ready for the desktop, but what's next after the desktop? Well, no one knows for sure, but we here at Linode are looking forward to bringing it to you when it's ready. And that's it. Leave a comment, like this video, and subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of more content like this here at Linode's YouTube channel.